uh, standing by that can help you with any audio issues that you have as well. Um, so just want to welcome all of the folks. We have folks from the regional centers here joining us from the US Department of Education. Um, I see folks in the chat that are from our cross-state collaborative on educator shortages. So welcome to those states. Um, we're delighted to have you all here with us today. And um, just as a reminder, this is for beyond selection and hiring, uh, diversifying the educator workforce by eliminating barriers and creating pathways throughout the educator pipeline. My name is Lisa Lachlan. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders. Um, we are an organization that is committed to partnering with states and districts to uh, promote and support a talented and diverse educator workforce for all of our students, but particularly for those that are in underserved school communities. Um, we're really grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you today about this topic. And I have two of my uh, favorite colleagues here with us today, Andrea Guiden, I should say Dr. Andrea Guiden and Itai Mizrav, who um, are great colleagues in this work, have done a lot of work in many states, um, and will be sharing that work with you today. Um, and then we also have Dr. Constance Lindsay joining us uh, from UNC Chapel Hill. She has done a great deal of work with her colleagues um, co-authoring this book, Teacher Diversity and Student Success. Um, we're delighted to have her with us. If you haven't bought this book yet, please consider doing so. Um, you'll hear a lot about it today, but um, it's worth the read too. So we have a discount code for all of you um, in an upcoming slide and just welcome you to listen to her, um, her scholarly work and consider buying the book as well because I think it can prompt us to do this work in a research-based way. Um, so I'm just gonna kick us off with a few thoughts here um, to kind of connect the dots between some of the work that we've been doing at the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders and this topic for today. So many of you over the last year, maybe two or three years have heard us talk a lot about educator shortages. And in that conversation, we talk a lot about how it's a systemic problem, it's a persistent problem that isn't just a result of the pandemic, but an ongoing problem that affects um, our students across the country. And on the next slide, we have highlighted those students who are impacted the most by educator shortages. Those students are students in low income communities, students of color, students with disabilities and English learners. Those students are also more likely to be, to have been impacted or continue to be impacted by the pandemic. And in some cases, these are the students that would really benefit the most from us addressing this issue with the lack of diversity in our educator workforce. So we see this combination of impacts that are really affecting these students and recognize that it's kind of a combined issue, a combined problem that we all need to work on together. On the next slide, um, I want to just highlight that part of the problems of barriers into the profession, it's not just the selection and hiring piece. That's why this webinar is called Beyond Selection and Hiring. It's really about uh, barriers across the career continuum. There are people of color who would like to join our profession at every step of the career continuum. And yet our system has barriers and systemic inequities that prevent that possibility or limit those possibilities. So today, throughout this webinar series, we want to recognize that the challenge of educator shortages is also the challenge of educator diversity. So we'll delve into the details in graphs like what was on the last slide. But first and foremost, we want to recognize that if we're going to address the educator shortage problem, we have to simultaneously think and address the educator diversity problem. And thankfully, as you see on this screen, the US Department of Education and federal programs in general are starting to really make this connection as well. So the connection specifically between educator shortages and educator diversity. 
So the American Rescue Plan, as many of you know, many of you probably know all too well, asks state education agencies to address the immediate needs of students who have been impacted disproportionately by the pandemic. And within those requirements, state education, state education agencies are asked to address and describe how they will support um, the educator workforce in section F of that plan, and then specifically how to support local education agencies with expanding the educator pipeline and educator diversity. So this is an important combination that we see right within the ARP requirements that we have this connection between the pipeline and diversity itself. Um, so these new funds, which many of you are just in the midst of thinking about how to create new programs or build the programs that you already have developed, um, the new funding gives us this great opportunity to connect shortages and diversity in a way where we can really address um, issues across the career continuum. And of course, uh, those funds really need to be used strategically in this way. Um, and we're, we're hoping that we can push you in that direction in this conversation and in the conversations that we have throughout this series. Um, so before we jump into the content of the session, as I said, we want to make this interactive. So we'd love for you to fill in the chat box with the answers to these two questions. The first one, do you have work currently underway in your state, your district, your organization that is focused on addressing both educator shortages and educator diversity? So feel free to say yes or no to that. And then which division in your organization is leading this work? Um, we ask that question because we know many of you come to us from divisions within state education agencies that are focused on talent management. Uh, some of you are in districts, in the district level, uh, working in human resources. Uh, some are working in capacities at any level of an, or any type of organization focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, others are focused on school improvement. So we're really curious to know what division um, is, is leading this work. And I see in the chat a lot of yeses, which is frankly a surprise to me, a pleasant surprise um, as, as to the answer to the first question. So both shortages and diversity. And then which division it looks like we're seeing human resources. Um, Alicia, if you could tell us which division specifically, that would be great. Um, let's see, teacher effectiveness and preparation, college of ed, uh, talent office, human resources, teacher quality, um, principal prep programs, office of talent management. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of answers and lots of yeses. That's very heartening to see. Um, well, so with that, I think I better keep us moving here. We have a lot of content to get through. So let me turn it over to Andrea and she'll keep the conversation going. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, my name is Andrea Guyton and I am an educator diversity lead at the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders with AIR. I'm also a historian of education and my scholarship highlights the history of education in America specifically the history of teachers, the history of teachers' work, and the history of education policies that have governed teachers' work uh, across several years. And I thought it might be interesting to take a step back and maybe look at a few historical events that have played a role in where we are today with the composition of the educated workforce. So very good. Thank you, Christina. So here I created a timeline that basically gives us a snapshot of particular moments in history and the history of teachers and teaching. Now, I wanna make it clear, first of all, that history is not clean like this. It doesn't come in clean linear lines and things don't happen like step one, step two. It can be a bit messy, but my goal for today is to just give you a few snapshots that give a context for what we're going to discuss today. So let's start first with 1837, which was the development of common schools. The common schools would be um, comparable to what we hear as or what we call public schools in the present day. However, these schools were designed primarily to serve white children. 
And the teachers in these schools were white, but most notably they were male. And teaching was seasonal work. It wasn't something that was year round, full time. It was a part time gig essentially for these white males before they went off to law school or um, to other university studies or even to become ministers in some cases. And over time, as the population of the United States became greater and we had immigrants coming from other countries, there was this, a disgruntled nature of conversation as it related to these new in, immigrants in the country coming from different countries. The complaint was that they don't know how to behave. They're too wild, they're too boisterous. We need to do something to Americanize them or to teach them the American way, how we behave here, what we believe here. And so the best way they decided to do this would be the schools, right? We start with children. And if we can educate children, the children learn the way things should be done. And they can then take that information home to their families. And who best to do this to teach these children, these morals, social mores, the American way, then women. Women are the first teachers. They have the children in the home, they're nurturing, they, are, um, they know what it's like to work with children. So women are the ones who would be best suited to be in schools, not men per se. Women are used to operating in the home sphere, but we'll put them in the public sphere and even give them a little money so we can pay them less than we're paying the male teachers. So what happens during this period, 1850 and afterwards, the teaching field becomes feminized. So we have primarily women, and these are white women who are going to be the, the conduits of education academically, socially, emotionally for the children in America. A few years later, at the end of the Civil War, education then becomes legally accessible to all. So the formerly enslaved, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, everyone has this ability to be educated legally and lawfully at this time. But the schools, however, are still segregated. Schools are segregated by race. So no one is going, none of the races are going to school together, but everyone is being educated within individuals that match their race or match their ethnicity. All the while, worthy of note is that the teachers in these schools, the segregated schools, also tend to be white and female. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Moving on to the mid 19th century, we have normal schools for teachers. And these schools exposed these women to a teacher training experience that wasn't offered in schools of higher education. They didn't necessarily have an education component. So the normal schools were what we used in order to train the teachers. Now, at this time, teaching begins to take shape in a different way than it did before when we just thought of women as nurturers in the schools. So now we have formal coursework. We have the development of standards. We have teacher credentialing. In essence, teaching is becoming professionalized. And these women teachers want to be seen as professionals. They want to be treated as professionals. And it's also during this period that we see the beginning of collective bargaining units, so teachers unions. They want someone to be able to speak for them so they can have agency, they can have autonomy in the work. Worthy of note here is that as these teachers are having normal schools and being credentials, these two are segregated by race. So we have normal schools predominantly for white teachers, for black teachers, for Latinx teachers, and everybody's on their own path to professional status, their own path to credentialing, but those paths do not look the same. And I wanna conclude this slide talking about women's suffrage in 1920, because it was especially during this period that white women teachers have this growing sense of power and belonging in the public sphere. They have a job, they have a paycheck, and they are the ones who are predominantly populating the schools. But we have teachers of other races who are battling a few isms in American society. So they're de dealing with sexism, they're dealing with racism, and they're also dealing with the idea that they too want to be seen as professionals, but they have the added struggle of also wanting to be seen as individuals within the American society as a whole. Christina, if you could go to the next slide. And so here we have segregated public schooling for students. Um, it was the order of the day. So while materials were often scarce in these segregated school um, systems, communities of color as a whole were really grateful to have the opportunity to legal cre legally create these um, learning environments. After all, multiple philanthropists, abolitionists, um, activists had fought long and hard for this right. Um, and so we were able to have schools, but they're segregated and still 
The teachers in many of these schools are largely white and female. Um, the court cases that I've listed here deal with issues of segregated schooling and the idea of um, using legislation and using policy in order to build equality into the American school system. And this is primarily through the means of desegregation. So these cases cover um, the desire for Asian Americans, particularly Japanese, Mexican Americans and black Americans to desegregate the schools and get more equality as it related to the education that students were able to receive. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the Teachers were largely white and female, and there were particular reasons for that. And these are a few barriers. This is just three, but there were multiple reasons why these um, teachers were not able to um, work in um, public school systems at the time. So first of all, black, indigenous, and people of color had limited access to institutions of higher education. Um, many of them did not meet the ever increasing criteria for teaching schools. And I want to note that there's a really rich um, body of historical literature that goes into historically Black colleges and universities and the development of those so that we can have more teacher candidates of color receive the education that they need to become teachers. But once upon, uh, once upon a time, they didn't have the access to higher education that perhaps other races may have had. Also, most school districts during the segregated period of education, particularly in the South, were run by individuals who held that teachers of color were inferior to white teachers simply by nature of race, not necessarily because of any, any grades in their normal school or any performance measures, but solely by race. And then finally, following the Brown ruling, there were lots of teachers of color who had the good fortune to maintain their jobs or to be hired for another teaching position, but they experienced severe workplace hostility that was based on race. And this impacted their professional, their economic, uh, social, and emotional well being. Okay, Christina. So in this slide, I talk about a few concerted efforts to maintain a white educator workforce. So for example, both before and following school desegregation in the 1950s and 60s, belonging to the NAACP was grounds for dismissal for many school systems because they perceived not only the NAACP to be an organization that was anti-American, but they also saw this organization's advocacy for black teachers to receive equal pay to white teachers as something that was threatening to the livelihood of white teachers in America. Secondly, we see changes to teacher tenure laws following Brown v. Board of Education. So as soon as Brown v. Board, the ruling came down, immediately teacher tenure laws in several states are altered to require additional years of service in order to gain teacher, gain tenure, and then additional requirements in order to gain tenure. Um, and that was a concerted way of making sure that the workforce maintained the composition that it had and did not have a, a huge rush of teachers of color. And there is historical literature to support that. And then the push for teacher competency and certification examinations intensified and test makers began including questions that reflected cultural bias intentionally in hopes of weeding out what they could call incompetent teachers. And then finally, over time, school systems began increasing the minimum passing scores on these exams in order to weed out, again, those teachers that we perceive to be incompetent. And this particular practice um, was maintained well into the 1970s. So it hasn't been very long um, that this was an issue. So all in all, at the end of the day, following Brown, approximately 38,000 Black teachers lost their jobs due to these concerted efforts to maintain a white educated workforce. So what I wanna do here in this final slide is link the past and the present as it relates to education policy. So first of all, let's look at then. And by then in this particular slide, I mean pre-Brown, so pre-1954. So then de jure segregation was the order of the day. And by de jure, segregation, we mean the official law of the land at that time. So this was legal, schools were legally separate, segregated. 
But now, and I'm sure many of you on here have read the literature and read the, the articles, schools are presently desegregated, but it's not as a result of de jour, and it's not legal to do that, but it's what we call de facto segregation. It's not legal, but it's happening somehow, some way. Um, and one of the reasons for this, we have embedded policies, whether educationally or federally, um, that allow school zoning to create situations where people who are happen to be of the same color and live in the same area are going to the same schools. And that's just one example. A second example of then and now um, is significant reliance on competency examination scores. Now, before I go into this, I wanna say that we at the GTL Center absolutely support standards for teachers and having fair mechanisms for ways to fill classrooms with effective teachers. Um, but the intention in this case was a heavy reliance on this so that we could weed out, like I said earlier, incompetent teachers and make sure that there were not too many teachers of color who could enter the workforce. We're shifting that in the present day. While there still is some reliance upon competency examination, um, scores. We also have an expansion of opportunities for licensure, multiple pathways for becoming a teacher, multiple programs that we have so that we can attract teachers of color to the education workforce. And then finally, I'll end with um, racialized screening of candidates. Once upon a time was absolutely a legal thing to do. And I won't go as far as to say that it's not happening today. But what I think we are doing is recognizing that it exists, that race-based analysis exists and it impacts who's being allowed to come into the classroom, who has access to the classroom. And I think it's important that we have events like this and that we have books like Dr. Lindsay's book that help us to realize it, recognize it, acknowledge it, and then do something about it. And that's part of our goal um, with today's event. Lisa, you want me to turn it over to you here? Sure, yeah. So again, we want to make this an interactive session as much as we can. Um, so we'd like you, our audience, to choose a question and write an answer in the chat. So I have a couple of questions for you. First, did you have a teacher of color when you were a student? If so, how did this teacher influence your perceptions of education? Or you can choose what information from this section might be useful for your colleagues. So go ahead and write your answers in the chat and we'll share that feedback. Looks like um, one of our audience members is saying, as for the teachers of color question, not of my race and not until high school. Um, another uh, audience member, no, as a minority, this was very, very hard for me. And I think, again, the answer to the first question, yes, she is the reason I'm in education today. I model myself after her and often share stories with my students about her. That's beautiful. All right, we have another audience member answering the second question, linking past history to present circumstances would be incredibly insightful for our colleagues. Um, another person answering the first question, yes, this teacher helped me shape my understanding of the Latinx community. Another uh, colleague answering no, I attended a private school, which was heterogeneous. Let's see, another that says yes, is a very positive force and retired from the district. Wow, lots of great answers here. <laughs> I will not be able to get them, get to them all. Um, I'm happy to see so many of you did have a teacher of color and how impactful that was for you. Um, and that is not a surprise. Um, so thank you for answering that. I hope this last session section was really helpful. We had a lot of positive feedback. Andrea, I don't know if you saw that in the chat. Um, so thank you for, for your presentation. And let me turn, turn it over now to Dr. Lindsay uh, to share her perspective on the research base for this work. Okay, thanks so much, Lisa. 
Um, so today I'm gonna uh, give an overview uh, about some of the research on teacher diversity um, and what that means for thinking about policies and practices and what we should be doing moving forward. Um, so the book of what I'm going to talk about today actually comes from a book that uh, my colleagues and I recently published um, by a Harvard Education Press. Um, and this is really meant to be a book that is uh, actionable and has items that are interesting and able to be used. And so um, if you know policymakers or, or other stakeholders um, who might be interested in it, the book is definitely written in such a way that um, folks can, can access it. So um, motivation for this work, um, and you know, as the motivation for all of the work that all of us do, um, is thinking about closing these very persistent and stubborn achievement gaps. So next slide, please. Um, and so we think that right now, thinking about um, these gaps and the interest in equity, we think teacher diversity is a critical way to close some of these gaps. And I'll talk about why that is and sort of the preponderance of evidence um, that has been created sort of, or that has been sort of uh, researched and, and shown that teachers of color make a difference um, in particular for students of color, but it's important for all students to have access to a high quality, uh, uh, diverse workforce. Next slide. So currently, um, today's teacher workforce is not representative of students. And this actually comes from a webinar that I did when I was still at the, the Urban Institute that you can go find, it's on their website. Um, but basically, nationally, we know that uh, teachers are largely white, they are largely female, and there are huge representation gaps between uh, teachers of color and students of color. Um, here, though, I'd like to point out uh, a few things. So one, if you think about sort of the the, if you think about the difference between the blue and yellow bars as representation gaps, you can see that gaps are actually the largest for Latinx students, which is actually something that I found quite surprising, um, but that, that is often overlooked in some of our discussions around teacher diversity. And I could talk a little bit about why that is in a second. But sort of nationally, we know that we have um, these huge gaps in representation, although there is nuance um, sort of based on where you are geographically. Next slide. And so basically what we're proposing is a roadmap for teacher diversity. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna sort of be switching back and forth as I'm talking about um, the work today, because some of this, uh, some of the stuff we need to do has to happen sort of right now with the workforce that we have. And then we also have to be thinking about what's gonna happen in the long term, right? And so I thought that slide that was uh, shown earlier that sort of shows this pipeline um, we have challenges now and we're going to have challenges later if we don't sort of intervene um, and think about uh, what the workforce is going to look like. And so um, the policy approaches that are being pursued are often tripped up uh, because the, the goals are not complete. Um, they have unrealistic timelines, right? And so we want to just think about, again, this issue of sort of thinking about long-term versus short-term. Um, and then sometimes they work at cross purposes. And so you might go raid a bunch of teachers from another district, but that's not helping sort of the whole workforce, right? And so we have to think about um, how these things are sort of working in concert with each other. And so, um, so what we're setting out to do in the book is basically trying to give some evidence-based policy recommendations um, and really to sort of capitalize on, on this current interest in uh, teacher diversity, which we think is super exciting. Next slide. So I won't spend too much time on it, but there's uh, a ton of evidence now, um, mostly owing to the fact that because we now have had many, many years of these very uh, comprehensive state longitudinal data systems where we're able to sort of look at things over time and look at things with very large samples, we've been able to build on previous studies that looked at sort of the role of teachers of color that maybe had smaller samples that used um, qualitative perspectives. And so we've been able to sort of um, uh, replicate and show that with, with very large samples in lots of different places, that same race teachers have impacts on a host of outcomes. So I have some work with Cassie Hart at UC Davis where we look at exclusionary discipline. Um, there are studies that show uh, improvements in test scores. Uh, teachers of color have higher expectations for students of color. Um, and students of color are, are have a higher likelihood of being placed into gifted and talented programs. Um, my colleagues and I also have a paper where we show that having a black teacher in kindergarten um, increases the chance of graduating high school and enrolling in college. And so um, 
And here I'll just, I'll take a, a little point of privilege and say that a lot of these studies are actually based on um, matches between black teachers and black students, because many of the states that have these um, longitudinal data systems don't have the, uh, the large populations of Latinx teachers that we would need to sort of look at some of these analyses uh, or from a quantitative perspective. Um, but you know the the hypothesis is still there that those teachers have um, similar impacts on their students as well and so given the sort of preponderance of evidence um, we sort of make the claim that diversity is quality right um, so instead of thinking about diversity as being sort of opposed to quality or orthogonal to quality we think that the ability to increase outcomes um, whether it's social emotional things or uh, academic outcomes should be considered as a part of the sort of set of things that make up teacher quality, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and then this is, isn't just in K-12, right? There's similar race matching effects in other settings like healthcare, uh, law, law enforcement, sports. And so I, I make this joke that I could just keep writing the same paper for different industries, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, next slide. So the other key piece of this too is that not only do we sort of just need more teachers of color, we also have to increase exposures to teachers of color, right? And so by that, we just mean that you have to be thinking about sort of the workforce that you do have right now, and maybe there's opportunities to sort of engineer um, more uh more ways for kids of color to experience teachers of color or, or all students. Um, and so what we're showing here in this table is basically that if you're a white student, you're just more likely to be exposed to a white teacher over time. Um, and uh, this is less, less so is less so uh, for other other students of color. Next slide. So we hypothesize that uh, diversity affects students in sort of uh, three different ways. Um, one, this question of teacher expectations of students' abilities and success. Um, teachers of color are more likely to offer uh, inclusive, relevant content in their instruction. Um, and then um, some of our evidence shows that uh, it's just simply, or not simply, but one piece of it is a role model effect, right? So if you, um, in particular, in our long run paper, we show that the effects are largest for young black boys who do not have a college educated parent at home. They are more likely to attend college if they experience that teacher very, very, very early on. Um, and so these mechanisms aren't mutually exclusive, but you might start to think about different policy implications sort of based on why you think um, these teachers are impacting these students. And, you know, we also want to keep coming back to the point that this also benefits white students as well. Um, their students show more empathy, more uh, tolerance for people of other backgrounds, um, and this is pretty consistent with a long body of work in the, in the psychology literature. Next slide. Um, and so Dr. Guyton did a, a wonderful job sort of uh, talking about the history, but as someone said in the chat, you know, thinking about this history is really critical because we don't want to repeat it, right? Um, we want to, you know, as we are faced with the challenges sort of in the post-COVID era, we don't want to repeat some of the things that we've done in earlier, earlier historical eras. Um, and this is a critical sort of element in thinking about students' access to quality schooling. And as we're continuing to discuss what integration means, we also have to think about how that impacts the workforce. Next slide. And so um, since sort of the, the loss of, of um, Black teachers in particular, um, we've seen increased sort of numbers of teachers of color, but the representation gaps are still very large. And so we have to continue to think about sort of what does our student population look like sort of in, in comparison to our teacher population. And so while the numbers might be getting larger sort of incrementally over time, we have a lot to do to think about this uh, representation piece. So the other critical piece too, and I think this is actually what makes this something, an issue area that's really exciting to work on, right? Which is that um, there are leaks, the leaks aren't exciting, but this makes it exciting work for us. <laughs> there are leaks in the teacher pipeline sort of at every stop, right? So you can think about, we just don't have the number of college graduates of color that we want, right? So in some ways at its heart, this is really a K-12, uh, access issue. But even moving sort of along the pipeline, um, education schools are more white than the student bodies in which they're housed. Unless um, you're talking about the, minor the nation's minority serving institutions who do more than their fair share of producing our teachers of color. 
even amongst the ed majors who enter teaching, um, teachers, uh, our teachers of color are more likely to leave. Um, and then we know that attrition is also sort of different by race due to different working conditions faced when folks get into the classroom. Um, and then, but we know that sort of once getting into the classroom, um, turnover isn't necessarily the challenge. It's really because teachers of color are more likely to work in high needs and hard to staff hard to staff places. And a lot of times they're getting into the work because they want to work in those types of schools, but we have to consider um, that they may be burned out. Um, and we might wanna consider other ways to sort of distribute them within districts so that they don't end up burned out. Um, okay. uh, next slide. So um, so we try to make this, this, what we think is a kind of provocative claim, but we think is really important, which is that teacher diversity is teacher quality. And so, for example, if you are a principal and you hire a Latinx teacher and he or she ends up um, serving as a translator for your majority ELL population, we think that work should be compensated. It should be um, considered as a part of sort of the duties. And we know that that's like kind of a, um, it's a new way of thinking about some of this stuff, but we think that because we know these teachers have these impacts on these, these outcomes, we have to bring it into our definition of quality. Um, and so you can think about sort of, you know, teacher, teacher, um, all of the challenges that sort of face the teacher profession. We think that, you know, teacher diversity is sort of just one spoke on an umbrella. And so we really want to bring it into our larger discussion of how do we define quality? How do we reward quality? How do we predict quality? Um, and it's, it's outside our scope, but we talk a little bit about how you have to think about the legal constraints on policy action and thinking about teacher race. Um, there are lots of constraints, obviously, on hiring and firing decisions, but there's lower stakes on things about strategic deployment, right? And so if you believe the evidence that, you know, having at least one teacher of color matters for students, you can think about ways to um, creatively work with the workforce that you might have now. Uh, next slide. So we suggest that there's um, some uh, policy approaches. Um, so I think you can uh, advance forward because it's going to build up there. Okay, yes, there we go. Um, so uh, one is sort of opening the tap uh, on teachers of color into schools. Um, we are extremely excited about grow your own programs, teacher residencies, which seem to be very promising, both in terms of um, teachers uh, sticking around longer and also in, um, having positive impacts on test scores and just being able to sort of fulfill districts needs with um, you know, the, the types of teachers that they know that they need for the types of positions that are available um, in their district. Um, we think that you, uh, districts can embrace alternative certifications. Um, we know that um, of, of many of the teachers of color who end up in the classroom now, many of them come through alternative route programs. And so we think that can be an exciting way um, to increase the numbers of teachers of color. Uh, we caution against poaching. So not just stealing from other districts. <laughs> uh, you know, we're trying to sort of uh, lift everybody up. Um, and this is another piece that I think is extremely exciting is lowering the teacher career ladder to provide entry to paraprofessionals. And I know that sort of post COVID, there are places that are experimenting with this. I know that Rhode Island, for example, um, is doing a program where they're, they're um, training their paraprofessionals to become um, fully certified teachers. And I think that's, that's great. Um, the other sort of uh, policy recommendation is thinking about um, engineering opportunities for more exposures to teachers of color, right? So go back to what we said about, about that piece of, about the evidence, about having at least one. Um, we think like the NFL, uh, hiring managers and principals should use the Rooney rule in hiring teachers and leaders of color, which basically just means that you make sure that your applicant pool is diverse, right? You, you, you actively go out and seek it. Um, thinking about tracking exposures, strategic assignment, um, and then other ways to just expose, expose um, students of color to adults of color. Uh, next slide. And then finally, um, since we don't have the, the workforce that we're aspiring to be, we think that you know, everyone could focus on developing cultural, cultural competency, right? So thinking about culturally responsive pedagogy um, and other sorts of trainings that um, allow teachers to explore their own biases and how, they might, how that might play out in their teaching. Next slide. Um, and so we have some selected policy recommendations in the book, and I think we can get into these um, 
in in the in the Q and A if we I think we'll have time. Um, but there's sort of like I said, this is exciting work because there's action to be done at every level, right? Um, you can think about uh, state leaders and that definition of what teacher quality is. You can think about district and school leaders as hiring managers. Um, from the federal perspective, we need um, data, work around data and monitoring. Um, there's a lot of work to be done for prep programs. Um, and then of course, us researchers, uh, we, we always wanna ask for more resources to do more research. <laughs> And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Lisa. Yeah, and so again, we wanna keep this interactive. So we're hoping to pull up a poll here, Christina, if you can help us with this. Uh, we'd like you to just answer this question, which of these three policy approaches is most needed in your context? Opening the tap on teachers of color into schools, engineering more opportunities for exposure to teachers of color, developing cultural competency throughout the workforce. I see answers coming in. We'll give it a few more seconds, maybe 10. Okay, it looks like the voting is slowly trickling in here. Um, and okay, I'm going to end the poll and you guys can see the results. Um, it looks like the majority of you are maybe not quite the majority, but a lot of you are saying opening the tap on teachers of color into schools. Um, and then the next one is the developing cultural competency throughout the workforce. All right. Well, so this was a bit of a um, our planting a seed in your minds here with this question. Um, we hope that you are thinking about all of these policy approaches as you do this work. Um, and we thought about putting all of the above as an option, but figured you'd all check that one. So we wanted to use this as an opportunity to get your, your wheels turning. Um, so thank you for that answer and hope we all are focused on all of these policy um, approaches in, in doing this work. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Isai Mizrav, who's gonna talk to you all about a new talent development data tool that he's developing. Um, we're really excited about this and excited to share uh, this in greater detail with you in our next session. Uh, but he just is gonna give you a quick um, introduction to it today so you get a sense of what we'll cover in the next session. Isai? Thank you, Lisa. It's difficult to follow Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Guyden, but um, uh, in, in the few minutes that we have uh, left, um, we're going to try to think about, okay, so what are we going to do about um, the disparities in our educator workforce? And I'm going to, as Lisa was saying, introduce, briefly introduce a tool that I'm going to demonstrate in depth on the webinar that's going to take place on uh, July 28th, the second part uh, of this series. Um, uh, this tool, uh, we originally developed a first version of it at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And since then, we worked with dozens of states and districts on utilizing the um, opportunities that are in that tool to understand your diversity data, to try and diversify the teacher workforce. And this new version that um, we want to introduce today and on the 28th, is uh, incorporates some of the lessons that we've learned over these years of working in the field and some of the things that we've noticed are important to, to, uh, to, to understand about the diversity of states and districts uh, teacher workforce. The tool which we call the GTL Talent Development Framework Data Tool is one element of the Talent Development Framework, which I invite you to go and see on the GTL website. It's part of our comprehensive approach of how we're going to go and look at issues of shortage and of issues of diversifying the teacher workforce. Now, uh, you can skip the next one. Uh, we also have a four part, a four step approach of doing this work of trying to get it right. Uh, that includes analyzing the segregated data where this tool uh, is this tool is part of that step. Uh, and then we, we go on a robust stakeholder engagement that includes a root cause analysis, a qualitative process to understand the roots or even the local roots of the disparities in the workforce, followed by the selection of evidence-based strategies. And then finally, making sure that these strategies work in the places that we want them to work. You can skip the next one. One of the, um, one of the um, 
sad things that I think uh, are we find out in this work is that the work is not only about remedying historical uh, problems, it's about changing discriminatory practices that we currently engage in. I was listening to Dr. Guyden and uh, she had a slide that's the historical barriers um, for um, uh, for teachers of color, for or for the the representation of teachers of color, and some of the data that the tool have shown us um, suggests that uh, we can eliminate the word historical and it would still apply. We would still we would still we're still seeing workforce hostility. We're still seeing these barriers, and if we're thinking about Dr. Lindsay's um, uh, statement that diversity is uh, quality, uh, this is really the motivation for our work here. Um, every teacher, including a white teacher, can be uh, can engage in culturally responsive instruction for sure. And some teachers of color may engage in, a, in an instruction that is not culturally responsive. But there is no such thing as a white or even a predominantly white workforce that is a culturally responsive one. We believe that diversifying the teacher workforce is a foundation, even a condition, for truly achieving a culturally responsive teacher workforce. But what is it that, that, that is a culturally responsive workforce? It's a workforce of teachers that, like Dr. Lindsay was saying, raise graduation rates for teachers of color, raise student achievement, uh, equitable assignment to discipline or to gifted and talented programs. These are just what good teachers do. And for that reason, we also see it as a foundation for creating equitable access to effective teachers. And creating equitable access to effective teachers is something that the GTL Center have done for many years, but we are now realizing that a condition of that is diversifying the teacher workforce. And that is the motivation why we have so much investment in this particular line of work. Let's give the next one. This data tool focuses on need that we found in the field to create um, a perspective that includes three, uh, that, that incorporates three elements. First, a perspective that looks at the entire continuum and identifies uh, the true drivers of diversity gaps within that continuum. A perspective that prioritizes the places and students in which diversification is most urgent. And at the end of the process, ensures that those places where diversification is most needed are the beneficiaries of the strategies. Let's give the next one. The, I'm going to show two elements of this tool before we close the webinar and then get to them in depth on July 28th. The first element, which you call the, the development of diversity gap, is an element where we ask, how do we get to this place where if we have, let's say, 50-50 split between students of uh, color and, uh, and teachers of color, we end up at, a, let's say, 84 or 16 um, uh, teacher workforce. And to do that, we break that process can skip to the next one we break the process into every single element that happens between being a student and being a teacher that retains for five years and that includes deciding to be a teacher getting your degree finishing your degree getting your license applying to jobs getting your job uh, retaining for five years and we look at the diversity of each one of these steps and when we do this in states and in districts, we find that um, oftentimes we can address common errors in the interpretation of the data. Sometimes we attribute the disparities to places that merely inherit gaps that preceded. It, for example, some districts really have significant gaps in, um, in, in the recruitment. Uh, they have pipeline that is not diverse and the, tools are, the tool allows us to see that, but some may have more issues around retaining teachers of color and, um, and we would immediately see that um, in, in the data. And this is where we'll, we're also seeing that, again, those barriers across the continuum that Dr. Guyden spoke about from the historical context, barriers in the recruitment of teachers and then barriers in the, in the actual working conditions and even potential hostility in the classroom, the tool allows us to show it. If you want to skip the next one. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the July 28th webinar, we will look at um, some new features that we're adding to the tool. Um, I would even call it a warning system, if you will, to try and help um, states and districts prioritize the places that need this work most. Now, often the intuition is go to the large metropolitan areas where um, uh, most students of color are. But with these new features that we're introducing, we'd like to try and spotlight groups and areas in states and in districts that are often overlooked. 
Um, and I'm talking about smaller districts, sometimes rural districts that are diversifying where students of color are least likely to meet, the, to meet teachers that share their race and, 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 and can encourage all these outcomes that Dr. Guy and Dr. Lindsay have talked about. So I will talk on July 28th about two um, perspectives of how to look at the diversity gap. The top one that is similar to what Dr. Lindsay showed earlier, that compares the student demographics to the teacher demographics. And then the bottom one that looks at ratios and really try to suggest which students are least likely to meet a teacher that shares their uh, race. It puts a spotlight on often smaller groups that we don't look at because they're smaller, but they are uh, nonetheless uh, underserved and underrepresented in the teacher workforce. So in, in uh, the next webinar and in webinar number three, that's gonna utilize some mapping features to try and, and, and understand who those groups are. We're gonna share some of those opportunities. Let me throw it uh, real quickly back to Dr. Lindsay to close off the content section and then back to uh, Dr. Lachlan. Sure. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. So, so yeah, so we just wanted to sort of underscore the fact that we think that teacher diversity is critical to uh, having an equitable education for all students. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, there's, there's tons of evidence now that diverse educators hold high expectations, serve as role models, um, they're very important gatekeepers when it comes to resources, so things like gifted and talented programs, and they improve both disciplinary and academic outcomes. And, you know, we think this is, is really critical. Uh, we think, you know, representation in public schools is a part of a healthy democracy. Um, and as we're thinking about um, what schools will look like both sort of now and into the future, we think that diverse school systems will be different school systems that are more tuned to um, this very diverse public that they now serve. Um, and we believe that the evidence shows that diversity impacts students in the long term, um, with good reason to believe that many of these impacts will have lasting intergenerational impacts. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay. Um, and now we're going to have some time for a question and answer, but I think before we do that, since we're uh, kind of tight on time, I'm just going to ask us to move one slide forward and I'm just going to share this reminder to all of you in case you need to jump to another meeting that we do have two additional sessions. One is on the 28th. Um, and the other is on August 3rd. The one on the 28th will share more of the data tool that Itai just presented to you. And we'll also have district level presenters that are going to share with all of you the experience that they've had working with us through our regional diversity labs and by using the tool in their context. Um, the third session then, We'll talk about how states are using our process to engage stakeholders in both uh, the use of this tool and in the use of our GIS mapping process. So we, we really look forward to sharing that content with you and hope that you will be able to engage with us at that time. Um, so having said that, let's jump into our question and answer um, segment. And I see we have a number of questions in the chat, one of which I'm gonna scroll back to here. Um, so I don't know who wants to answer this, but um, Mesa has asked, is having same race teachers aligned with the concept of diversity? It's a good question. So I would say yes. <laughs> um, and this is actually a question that we get a lot as people will say, if you're advocating for sort of these matches, are you um, also advocating for segregation? And no, absolutely not. Um, we think that you can do the matching within the context of your larger sort of human capital strategy, but also still focusing on diversity. So I think that's a good question. That's a great question. Yeah, and one that we've we've had pop up in our conversations as well. So I appreciate that answer, Dr. Lindsay. Um, we also just have the simple question, will you be sharing a recorded session? Yes, we would be happy to do that. We'll have it posted on our website as well. Um, it may take us a few days to get that content up um, because we'll need to do the closed captioning on the recording. But yes, that's our intention. So you'll have access to that in the future. Um, and then we have another question. Can you say more about the number of Latinx teachers that have been in the profession historically or even today? So 
that one that you can address, Dr. Lindsay? Yes. So I had that that one chart that shows um, the percentages. I don't know off the, off the top of my head. It was earlier on. Um, so this is going to be something that also varies uh, a great deal geographically. Um, mm -hmm. And so I mentioned that I, we can send it out, I guess, in the, the materials, but in that um, that data visualization that I, I talked about, we, you can actually go fill in your city and state and see what representation looks like in your local area. So obviously in places like Texas and California, there's lots more um, Latinx teachers, um, but there's other states that have growing populations of Latinx students, but not a concomitant growth of teachers. So for example, North Carolina has a, a, a burgeoning um, Latinx population that is largely underserved. Um, I have another paper where we're looking at leaders and we actually have uh, up until like 2000, there were no few um, Latinx principals and it's only been, you know, a little bit so far. So it kind of depends on where you are, uh, but there are definitely some places where the representation gaps are huge. That's a great question. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and it looks like people are saying, yep, in Florida too, I can speak of California. That's certainly the case as well. Um, Regina has a question. The Rooney rule has not worked in the NFL. How is it being reimagined to diversify the educator workforce? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so there is actually a paper, it's a group of researchers out of George Mason, where they talk about hiring in Fairfax, uh, the Fairfax School District in Virginia. Um, and basically they talk about how the stage of hiring um, exhibits some biases. And so um, our thinking around the Rooney Rule was just to sort of get around the issues that happen with bias at the hiring stage by mm -hmm. sort of ensuring that the pool is more diverse. But yeah, right, it, it's, it's um, hard to make sure that people actually get to the end. So the, a special attention needs to be paid to the fact that not only do you want this sort of strong, diverse pool, you also have to make the hires. So that's a great, great point. Excellent. And also pushes us to think about across the entire continuum, right? Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. just about, it's beyond hiring and selection, right? Excellent, thank you. All right, well, I see we're at time and I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I think we're, um, we can call it a wrap. I just wanna thank all of our presenters today, Dr. Guyton, Itai, Dr. Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Christina, for helping us with the background work. Um, and thank all of you too for attending and joining us today. It's a delight to have you all so interested in this topic, one of which Many of us have been working on for decades. And so to have an audience like this is such a delight. Um, so thank you for attending and we look forward to seeing you on the 28th. All right, Ollie, I think we're good to go. Um, good job so guys. Yeah, nice it talking. flew by. <laughs> yeah, it did. It sure did. And we were great on time. So thank you all for that. Yeah. Looks like, it's yeah. Rush there a little bit <laughs> at the end. Speak fast. Yeah. You did great. That was good. Uh, that was good.